McDougall has been an old friend of the symposium um, and uh, it's delightful to have her back with us. And uh, Serena in recent times has been, uh, as you can see from the screen here, doing a lot of work with yogic and Tibetan meditation. And uh, what we're going to hear about today is how this links in with a whole new growing psychic awareness that all the likes of us have been discussing. So I'm sure you're going to be very keen to hear how this can help us and where this is taking us. So I give you Serena Roni Dougal. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, and thank all of you for um, being here to hear what I've got to say. It's echoing weirdly for me, but um, I'm sure I'll get used to that. Um, yes, I, I, I got blessed by Lady Fortune, um, and I was invited to go and work in an ashram in Bihar in northeast India, and that's really what started me off on what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but during that time, I, for various reasons, um, went to one of the teachings by His Holiness Dalai Lama. Um, and that started me off on the Tibetan bit of the journey, um, which was an even greater blessing. Why do we meditate? Because essentially we want to become enlightened. What is enlightenment? Well, the Dalai Lama says that it's composed or its, its foundation are the twin pillars of wisdom and compassion. So today I'm going to try in my feeble way to give you a few drops of the wisdom that they give out in such plenty over there. Um, and then tomorrow when we do the meditation in the Abbey, I'm going to actually um, share with you the meditation that he taught us on that very first teaching that I had with him, which is um, what's called bodhicitta or loving kindness meditation. So hopefully over the two days I give you just a tiny little drop from both of the two pillars or foundations of enlightenment. But today it's the turn of trying to share a little bit of wisdom with you. Now you will see that I've got one of these wonderful PowerPoint presentations up here, but I'm at primary school level compared with what you've just seen. And basically they're sort of, it's a, it's a glorified overhead projector with notes that keep me on track. Yeah, so you know, don't expect all the wonderful little things that you've had, these are just my notes. Um, I'm going to start off by giving you a bit of philosophy. And the essential philosophy of both Buddhism and the yogic philosophy is that consciousness is reality in all its different forms. In other words, we turn Western, modern, scientific worldview on its head. Because our mythology in the West at the moment, that in the beginning there was nothing, and from that nothing, somehow, they don't explain how it came, what they call a singularity, which just means a oneness, that's all, a oneness. And then that went bang. And from the bang, we get the matter, and then from the matter, we get the planets, and then from the planets, we get life, and from life, we get animals, and then humans. And wonders of wonders, we get consciousness and mind. Well, out in the East, they say in the beginning was consciousness. And it's consciousness all the way down. Everything has consciousness at its basis. So, essence of matter is the, what we'd call the unconscious state of pure consciousness. Yes, so, you know, you don't expect matter to get up and start talking and walking and giggling and joking and having a laugh. Yeah, matter just is the chair that you're sitting on. You expect it to just have chair consciousness and be a chair and not start being a tap dancer. And if it does start being a tap dancer, you're going to get worried about it. Yeah? So that's matter at its unconscious level. Plants, well, we've got some pretend plants here. 
Um, but they're the next level up, they're subconscious. So they've got a measure of consciousness, yes, they turn towards the light, they're affected by being put into, shrimps being put into boiling water and they start screaming. You, you've probably read Life of Plants and you know that plants react. Yes, plants are sensitive. So, you know, there were things, um, people are going on about Wi-Fi and cell phones and plants probably do this, you know, rather than this. Yeah, at sort of nasty energies. Then animals, the conscious state. Now, nobody's going to tell me that my cat doesn't have consciousness. She's also got a sense of humor. Um, she's also fairly stroppy. Yeah, if well, anybody's got cats, they know. Dogs, pretty much the same. They're, they're less stroppy in general. <laughs> in general? Yeah, okay. Yeah, all right. So then we come to humans. And humans, where the difference with us is that my cat looks in a mirror, but it doesn't see itself. I look in the mirror, I see myself. I am self-aware. And through this self-awareness, our creativity and our wonderful art forms and our architecture and our beautiful music and, yeah, all the things that, that is human, as well as attempting to become enlightened. My cat is enlightened. She doesn't have to try. I have to try. So that's the difference. That's, that's, that, that's the basic fundamental understanding. Yeah, so I'm, I'm giving you primary school level because that's all I know at this moment in time. So I'm passing it on to you. But it, it, I like it. I like it as a basic philosophy. It makes sense to me. Um, and so I'm working with this basic philosophy. Now, the thing about psychic awareness is it's not using our normal senses and our normal activity. It's working outside of our normal sense motor realm. So I can become aware of what's going to happen in the future. It's not coming through my eyes, it's not coming through my ears. It's another format that I'm getting that information. I can do healing onto a plant, and I'm not directly watering the plant or giving it bio or whatever. I'm giving it something else in another way. Yeah? You got that? So it's not the normal. So that's why I've got it that the psychic processes are the motor, the active, and the receptive, like the senses, but they're of this, what I've called the essence. Now, in the origin, I was using a word that comes from the Hindu, which is soul, but I've been working with Buddhists the last three years, and they don't believe in soul, but they do believe in essence. So it's that other aspect of our being, which is not this out here, see, touch realm. Yes, it's that slightly implicit level, that, that bit that is there at the back of things that we can connect in with, but it's not this one. You, you with me? Yeah, yeah, have I got that one clear? So that's what we're doing when we're talking about the psychic awareness bit. Now, the tantric philosophy that I'm going to be talking a little bit more about is even more specific. Now, somebody said there was a thingy that... Sean Lights, is this it? Yes. Ha! What the tantric says is that consciousness manifests from what they call Turiya, which I've translated as transcendent, and it manifests its way down through to the gross level. So at its very subtlest form, call it consciousness with big C, which is all is and everything, all that ever was is or will be, big C, the whole thing. This is the transcendent level. This is the level of Turiya. Well, actually, it's a bit beyond that, but we won't go into that one. So it then manifests down through these different levels, and we can think of gross as the, as the basic matter level, although they actually have gross in terms of our consciousness as well, and that we have these different levels of consciousness. And then, having manifested, there is another force, which I've called here evolution, which is the driving force back to the transcendent. So here we are as humans and, you know, with many people, there's this aim for what I call enlightenment, which is that place of complete wisdom and complete compassion. 
Uh, Dalai Lama is as good a role model as we've got. So think of humanity trying to go there and, and maybe even beyond. Yes, that's what we're wanting to do. That's, the, that's another driving process. So you've got these two processes working together. And the purpose of meditation is to help us go from gross level of consciousness up and up and up. Now, I'll give you an example of how they understand these different level of consciousnesses. So this is our ordinary everyday thinking. It's bloody bloody blah, blah, the mind going on, and it's my taking in from the senses, it's my putting out through the words and so on. The next level, what's called Swapnil, the subtle, we can think of as dream consciousness. So you go to sleep, you have a dream. What is that consciousness? What's it connecting with? The yogis say that the night of the layperson is the daytime of the yogi. That yogis actually can stay consciousness, conscious in the dream state. And the Buddhists also have what they call dream yoga, and they work to bring consciousness through to the dream state. And this is one of the levels that one can get to, that you can stay in full consciousness in the dream state and learn to work with your dreams. So Tibetan Buddhists, they believe that when you die, your consciousness goes on in all the different forms, and if you've learned to stay conscious at the dream state, then you can stay conscious in what they call the intermediate state between this life and the next, and that is like being conscious in your dreams. So this is a level that we could get to. Nidra, or the causal state, is think of when you're asleep, you've got dreams, but you also have the deep sleep state that's between dreams. Okay, you've got to be conscious in that state. All right, so this is, whoa, this is going to the another level of depth of consciousness. And then Turiya, the transcendent, which is way beyond anything that I could even begin to describe to you. So... Talking still about the tantric, because this is quite key for the work I've been doing. Um, in the tantric philosophy, how you get the different forms through to matter is via energy. That consciousness just is. But it's consciousness with energy that creates the different forms. And they call this vibration of energy spanda. And it's very interesting because the latest theorizing in parapsychology, which is scientific research into psychic phenomena, is actually looking at superstring and matrix theory, which is a sort of the deep end of physics, which is where we're talking about vibration, just vibration. That's what superstring's about. And they're saying that this is actually how the universe comes into manifestation. And this is the tantric teachings from India, which they reckon are a good four to five or even 6,000 years old. So these teachings are right up to date, which I find really interesting. Now I'm going to bring it into us, and we have this mixture of consciousness and energy. And the energy in the body is called the nadis. So they reckon that we have, well, different people have different things. 144,000 is one thing I've seen. Half of that, 72,000 I've read somewhere else. But there's three main nadis. One, two, three. The main one, Sashamna, coming up the center of the spine. Think of it as a silver cord coming up the center of the spine. And then weaving around it are what are called Ida and Pingala. Ida being, you can think of as moon or as yin, its mind aspect. Pingala, you can think of yang or as fire, creative energy aspect. Once again, consciousness and energy coming together. You get this consciousness energy concept again and again and again. Now, this, the Tibetans and the yogis have slightly different concepts at this point. Up until now, what I've been saying is common for both. And I was fascinated, having spent three years in the ashram and then three years in a Tibetan monastery, to discover how similar the concepts were. 
But then I discovered that the Tibetans got their teachings from the Himalayan regions of India a thousand years ago. And, and so you can see it's the same tree, but branches that branched out a thousand years ago. So you get subtle differences while the same basic root is the same. And so the yogis say that Ida and Pingala will cross and cross and cross a bit like the caduceus. Whereas the Tibetans say that Ida goes up one side and Pingala up the other and they come and they touch at certain points, but they don't actually cross. So two slightly different understandings of the energy system within our bodies or connected would be a better word, connected with our bodies. Where these cross are what are called the chakras, or where these touch are what we call the chakras. Now, I was fortunate to be taught about the Tibetan Tantric teachings by a very great Rinpoche, Kirti Senchab Rinpoche. And he kept saying, with regard to, because I went to him about Tibetan teachings on psychic phenomena, and he kept saying again and again that for psychic purposes, it's really important to do what he called purifying the wind channels. The wind channels being the energy channels, the nadis. Wind being the same as what the Hindus, the yogis call prana, prana, the life force. So when we're talking the wind, we're talking the life force, the vital force, the energy force. And all the different aspects of psychic phenomena that he taught me the Tibetan understanding of, he kept saying the same thing. We've got to purify these energy channels. So I know in this crowd there are many people who work as healers, who work as clairvoyants, who work as psychics, who do energy work. And this is one of the, one of the, the, the teachings that was most often stressed. Most often stressed is probably the best way of putting it. So, moving on, the, as I told you, these are just notes to help me um, keep on track because I'm aware that we have a time limit here and I could talk to you for days, <laughs> days. Um, where these points meet are what we call the chakras. And up here, third eye, which is actually, the, this point where, where we have at the, the center of the forehead is actually what's called a trigger point. It's a focus point for us. But really, where this third eye chakra is, is right in the center of the head. So if you take a line above the ears here, and then through from here, Yes, and then down through the fontanelle. Have you got that 3D line? They're right in the center. That is where Agya Chakra is. And Agya Chakra is considered by both the yogis and the Tibetans to be the psychic center, to be the third eye. Now, we have it in the West as the seat of the soul, that word that I avoided using earlier. But for me, when we're talking psychic, that's that aspect of our being that we're talking about. And that is where it is at that point, where these three channels meet, the central channel and the Ida Pingala, where you've got all the energies absolutely balanced. Now, this location in the pineal gland, I'm going to give you a five-minute nutshell of 20-odd um, years of research about the pineal gland. And the, I, I'm giving it to you because um, it's, it's this link between meditation and psychic awareness in practice. Yeah, in practice is what, we're, what I'm talking about here. And what has been found is that the pineal gland, the third eye, makes a chemical that interacts with a very common neurotransmitter in the brain called serotonin. And from this interaction, we get an incredibly potent hallucinogen called DMT made. Now, back in the 60s, DMT was called the businessman's trip. Because it very, acts like LSD, it's very quick acting. 
And the joke was that the businessman in the city could put on his bowler hat, umbrella under one arm, times under the other, go out for his lunch break, drop some DMT, go to the park, have a trip, and be back in time for work one hour later. That's how quick acting it is. Now, the weird thing is, is that we make this illegal class A hallucinogen all the time in our bodies. So I'd like you to know that every single one of you are now under arrest for having a class A hallucinogen in your body. It, it's, it's, it's the mockery, really, isn't it? Question is, why do we make it? And why does the pineal gland contribute to it being made? What is going on here? Well, what we found in parapsychology is that people who write in to the Psychic Research Society saying, I just had a major experience. I was fast asleep in my bed, and for some reason I woke up at three in the morning and there was great Aunt Edith standing at the foot of the bed, smiling to me and waving a little. And then she disappeared and I fell asleep. And I woke in the morning and I told my family I had this amazing dream. And then I got the phone call to say she'd passed away peacefully in her sleep at three in the morning, which meant that she'd come to see me. And people, you know, I mean, this sort of experience is overawing for people, yeah? It's it's profound experience that really, you know, wow, you know, she came to see me at that moment. Dreaming and nighttime is the key time for spontaneous psychic experiences. We're not we're separating spontaneous from what I'm going to be talking about, the meditation stuff, which is a taught, the spontaneous. When we are in that dream, do you remember? It's one of the four states of consciousness of the tantrics. When we're in that dream state of consciousness, this is when we are most open to and aware of that aspect of reality the dream state of consciousness. And the pineal gland literally is the psychic center, the third eye, in that it is creating the chemicals that take us into that state of consciousness. Now, the work that I've been doing is looking to see to what degree this spontaneous aspect can be trained. Because the yogis say, and the Tibetans say, that by doing the work on the energy system, the wind channels, and most particularly by doing the work on third eye, so we can train ourselves to become more sensitive and more aware at the psychic level. Because the problem is, and those of you who are working in this area will know this far better than I do, the problem is, is that the psychic, you know, you see it one day and then you don't, it's like it comes and goes, and sometimes you have good days and you're spot on, spot on, spot on, and then you have a bad day and it's like, you know, you're, you tell your clients, come back tomorrow, you know, it's, it's not... It's not happening today, for whatever reason. Now, I'm looking at what those reasons are with the spontaneous, but I'm also looking at this trained aspect. The Tibetans are very clear about what they call clairvoyance. They say in order to become enlightened, you have to become clairvoyant. You have to have worked at that level. You have to have got yourself cleared at that level. All the wind energy clears and, 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 and your consciousness cleared at that point. And they say that the spontaneous psychic is not reliable. And if they use the psychic stuff every day, all the time, they're always using divination and healing and all the rest of it. And they have the, what I would call the wise women, the lay people, the healers and the oracles working in the villages. But the, they go for serious things to the high lamas because they consider that the spontaneous, while it works, sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't, it's not reliable. If they want something reliable, let's say, you know, the, the, the looking to find the next Panchen Lama or the next Karmapa or whatever, and they will do various divination methods, they want to be 100% sure, 100% sure. So they'll go to a high lama who's trained, who's reached that point in their consciousness. 
that they are right there all the time on demand which I was smiling at Elche and what he was saying is, you know, can't get it on demand. These guys reckon you can, but you're getting pretty close to enlightenment by the time you've got there. This is what I've been saying, yes? As you develop what they call samadhi. Samadhi is that state of consciousness where you've gone beyond the gross, the jagrat. You've gone beyond the dream. You've gone beyond the deep sleep mind. You're in that turiya, in that transcendent. You're in the one-pointed focus where all is. You, you, you practice meditation? Yeah, yeah, lots of nods. You know as you sit, let's say you're concentrating on the breath, nice and simple, and you think, my foot's gone to sleep. Back to the breath. I forgot to telephone. Back to the breath. What was that dream I just had? Back to the breath. Yeah, you know. So we have that. Now, if you can get it that you're just aware of the breath, there's no thought state at all, then you're coming close to the next step towards samadhi. I worked in ashrams. I worked in Tibetan monasteries over the last six years. Great blessings. And I did four studies, of which I'm giving you the results of two here. Now, I've done it in picture format, no p-values. <laughs> if you see, we've got a line going up here. Do you see it? So 100%, it's a little wibbly-wobbly, but it's quite a clear line. Now, this, you do what's called a correlation, and it's slipped slightly off the thingy. But on this side, which has slipped off the thingy, is how psychic the person is. And on this side is how many years of meditation practice they've done. Now, you will see that those who've done no meditation practice are not showing very much at all. And that as you do more and more meditation practice, so your levels of reliable awareness shall we call it that, levels of reliable awareness, get stronger and stronger and stronger. And this guy, who's done over 30 years of meditation, living in a monastery right up in the middle of the Himalayan mountains, was phenomenal. He was something else. It was like, for that year, he was the high point. It was unbelievable. He's way out beyond the others. But he's also way out beyond the others in terms of how many years of meditation practice he's done. He's done over 30 years. It's slow. You've got to keep your practice. You've got to do it every day. No distractions. Keep the focus. Keep doing it. It does make a change, yes? Right from the beginning, we're seeing slowly, 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 the change is happening. Now, this hasn't been seen by anyone yet. You are the first people to see this. I'm going to be reporting it at a scientific international conference in Winchester next month, the full details, the whole thing. But you see, we've got essentially the same thing. Not quite as strong, not quite as clear, but again, we've got the basic same idea um, that the people who've done very little, they're sort of wobbling down here, and then this guy is way out above the others. He's had 40 years of meditation practice. Basically, up until 20 years, you're all in a cluster. Up until 20 years, there's not much happening. But once you get over the 20 years, then it really starts to reliably show. Now, up here, you see I've got what's called the correlation. The correlation is how, how clearly are you on that line? How clearly does your reliable psychic awareness correlate with how many years of meditation. And you'll see that all the studies we've done, so this one is this 0.52, this one is this 0.49. Yeah, one is stronger than the other, but they're both actually what's called significant, the, the, the P-levels, they're both below the 0.05. Um, and they correlate very strongly with what I found in the ashram. I didn't put three charts up because easier just to look at two. Um, 
and the ashram one was 0.57, so actually slightly stronger even than this was what I found in the ashram, working with the swamis and the students there. So I've done it four times. We've had the same result every single time. Now, in terms of presenting this to the scientists, one time they'll go, go away and do it again. Two times they'll go, OK, we're beginning to get interested. By the time you've done it four times, they're going to say, OK, where's the flaw? Where's the fraud? They've got nothing else to fall back on. And what I want to say to you from this is that do the work, get those wind energies clear, Get your meditation, good and proper, every day. Keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. And what you have as a natural gift, a spontaneous, now you see it, now you don't, you can get more and more reliable. You can shift your consciousness daily, bit by bit. I think of it as like playing the piano. You know, the, you do your scales, you do your exercises, you learn. Now, some people are really gifted. It's easy for them. Other people like me, you know, I'm never going to be a concert pianist, but I can play at home, give myself, you know, a nice evening of, of playing the piano, good bit of fun, play with the kids, have a sing-song, enjoy. And that's what that daily practice... You, you, it gets there, slowly, slowly. Slowly, slowly, it gets there. What am I doing for time? This was the high point. The, the one that had done 30 odd years of meditation and was way out from the others. It's, um, it's a, 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 a valley called Zanskar Valley in the Himalayas. So this is looking from the monastery. That's the village down below. Those are the mountains at the end. I spent a week with him. This is taken from the room. He let me sleep in his room in the monastery. I think I'm probably the only woman ever to have done so. I don't know. It was like such an honor. Um, we worked at dawn. So this is the sun just coming up. Yes, yeah, so, uh, we did our work at, at dawn, sunrise, and again at sunset. And you can't quite see on this, but there are windows here. And that's the room where His Holiness Dalai Lama slept when he stayed at this monastery. And nobody's allowed to sleep anywhere higher than where he's. But you can see I'm, I'm pretty close. <laughs> and this is my translator here. And this was the path that had, I had to walk up with the computer on my back to up here, this is where the monastery is, every day. And it's, I'm, I'm 4,000 meters up. Breath, problem, walk five steps, stop, catch my breath, walk five steps, stop, catch my breath. I said to my translator, go and tell Lama that I'm coming, put the kettle on for me, you know, make me a cup of tea. So he, you know, runs up, being born and brought up there. And I, you know, half an hour later, no, it took me an hour and a half, actually, an hour and a half later, you know, I'm there. And he's sitting on the wall with, you know, some of the other monks and they're watching me, you know. <laughs> and one of them says something to somebody and he says it to somebody and he says it to my translator. My translator looks at me and he says, they say there's a road round the back that'll be easier for you. <laughs> I count my week there as one of the most greatest blessings I've ever had. It was just amazing. This is uh, from a, a Tibetan monastery, Sarah May Monastery in southern India, which is where I did um, most of the work. I mean, I had that time in, in Zanskar and Ladakh, but most of the work was done here. And what I've just said to you about the bit by bit, this is what their teaching is. And that's really interesting that what I found is actually supporting the Buddhist teachings. And here they've got the path to enlightenment. And there's the enlightened person, yes, up the top there. And you will see that with the monk, there's an elephant and a monkey. And as they go up the path, slowly the elephant and the monkey change from black to white. Do you see? Slowly, slowly, slowly getting whiter and whiter. But at a certain point the monkey gets left behind and only the elephant gets pure white and goes on and up. 
what they're saying is the change happens bit by bit, but not everybody makes it. Not everybody makes it. But it is, it's a bit by bit thing, and that's what their teaching is. And I, 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 went, I, I saw this. It's a mural outside of one of the, 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 the temples on the entranceway. And I, I, I'd seen it, and then I'd forgotten where I'd seen it, and I knew I wanted it to illustrate the teaching. So I was running around, everybody searching for it, and finally found it, which I'm really pleased about. Okay, I wanted to give you a little bit about the... This comes from Kurtid Senshav Rinpoche, um, who was teaching me all about Tibetan beliefs. Um, because they have had the psychic practices as part and parcel of their culture since forever. Um, and most of the Tibetan psychic practices are very old from the, what's called the burn, the pre-Buddhist shamanic tradition. So the oracle who becomes possessed by a deity and who then speaks words of advice and wisdom and teaching and so on. Um, or what they call the mo divination, which is maybe where they will um, throw dice um, in order to answer your question. They have many different forms of, of divination that they do. Um, and if you remember, you have to purify the wind energies to, um, to, to be able to do these things. But they feel that Buddhism coming in has helped to overcome some of the problems that you do get within a shamanic spirituality. Now, in the West, recently, we've taken on shamanism as a sort of the great thing, which in some ways is very good for our rather materialistic reductionist culture to reconnect with. However, there are problems with it. And I just wanted to bring out some of these problems. So, for instance, I live in Glastonbury. And I see people with their twisty, scar twisty staffs, with the crystal on the top, and their cloak. And they're well above you and me, because, I mean, you know, they're shamans or witches and they don't consort with us common folk. It's a huge problem. Uh, you know, having lived here nigh on 30 years, you know, one of the locals the other day looked at me and said, well, you're part of the furniture now, aren't you? I thought, oh, I've made it. <laughs> part of the furniture, I've arrived. It is a big problem. Ego and, hu ego and humility, you know, take the, the, uh, taking ego there as fluffing up your ego. Now, you know, we all know from our spiritual work that somebody who is ego-less at the beginning is actually somebody who's probably slightly psychotic and they're a bit dispersed all over the place. You need a good, healthy ego to become truly ego-less. Do you see what I mean? But... That good, healthy ego has got to learn humility. I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a, a... I mean, I have so many examples of this. But um, a lot of my friends now are getting old and they haven't done their yoga and they haven't, you know, kept their bodies in good trim. And I practice my yoga every day. And, you know, there they are talking about their bad backs. And I'm thinking, well, aren't I lucky? You know, because of my practice, I've got a really strong back and I'm in really good shape. One week later, I'm crippled. <laughs> Pride always comes before a fall. Humility is knowing that actually you've never got it sussed fully. Yeah, and you don't even dare to have that thought. Don't even dare to have it. As soon as you have that thought, touch wood. <laughs> My back's going to be all right. Yeah, that's what true humility is. So that was one of the big things. Now, I was very interested with the confidentiality and secrecy that... I got again and again from the Tibetans. So when I first went and I met with the director of, of one of the big institutes, he said, nobody will work with you because all of the monks take vows of confidentiality and secrecy. Nobody 
is going to tell you how good they are at meditation. They won't do it. Nobody is going to tell you that they are able to predict the future. They just, you just don't say these things. You just keep it all very secret. Now, I had to laugh because, A, it's part of the Western magical mystery tradition, this to know, to will, to dare, to keep silent. Yes, you don't speak about it. But also in parapsychology, we've got a thing that if you are doing an experiment and you're getting really shit-hot results, you don't mention it. One person came to a conference and he was doing some research with what's called the Gansfeld, again, altered states work. And, you know, they were halfway through and he presented his results. Look, isn't this amazing? From then on, nothing happened. By the time he'd finished the experiment, there was zilch. Good lesson for us. Don't speak about it. Power corrupts and... Spiritual power corrupts superlatively. We know about power corrupting. We only have to look at the wonderful president of the United States to see how power can corrupt. We don't have many heads of state like His Holiness Dalai Lama or, bless him, Mandela. In general, there's a problem. And there's even more of a problem with spiritual power, and we only have to look at the history of the Roman Catholic Church and some of the popes um, that have been in the past who were fairly corrupted by um, their power. Problem. Watch it. And I really, I, I felt, you know, I was given this teaching as part of my work, and I really wanted just to share it with you. Fraud, well, you've already had that one, haven't you, from Elchio. Um, the... In fact, everybody who I interviewed said, watch out, there's charlatans. Check, 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 check all the time. Check the person, check their credentials. What work have they done? What do people say about them? Are they reliable? Are they honest? Are they good? Check it the whole time. Distinguishing fact from fantasy. Again, Alchia has talked about that most wonderfully. Um, and we do have a big problem with that in the psychic realms in, in the West. Um, there's a lot of fantasy out there. I used to have the analogy of... Um, I, I did want to stop and let you have time for questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to um, tie this up quite quickly. But I just wanted to, to, to say to you that my, my, my understanding of the psychic realm is that you're in Dartmoor, and there's a mist coming down, and you see those fairy lights, and you get entranced by the fairy lights, so you go after the fairy lights, yes, the glamour and the glitter, the glitter, the fairy lights, and you're going after the fairy lights, and all of a sudden, as the mist is coming down and the dusk is deepening, you realise you're in deep bog. <laughs> That's the one. Now, what I like about parapsychology is that in the middle of that deep bog, there is one of these lovely little twisty, gnarly hawthorn trees, and you can hold on to it because where its roots are, it's a little bit more solid, the ground. A little bit more solid, but not really. And, of course, I've just mentioned glamour. Goes with ego. I did want to show you this lovely lady, Amitabha. So this is Amitabha. Amitabha, she's one of the wise women I was talking to you about, one of the village people. She does what's called mirror divination. And she is so well loved and well respected. She's gorgeous. She always has a queue of people. And the person with her, this, he's my translator. Because, of course, I had to work with translators all the time. And I'll give you... Very quickly, just an example that uh, why he loves her so much is that he and his wife had been married for several years and had not been able to conceive any children. And they were really concerned about this. They'd been to the doctors, they'd been to the hospitals, they'd tried everything that everybody had said. They went to Amitabha. Amitabha said, you do a pilgrimage up to Bodh Gaya, which is where Buddha got enlightenment, you do money to the nuns for prayers. You do this, you do that. Within a month of doing the pilgrimage, they had their first child, and now they've got two. Yes. Yes. And she was... Uh, the, 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 the thing about karma 
is she was the seventh person in her family to have this gift. So her father had had the gift, um, her great aunt had had the gift and so on. And I asked her, she doesn't have any children, did she know if the gift was carrying on through the family in Tibet? But unfortunately the Chinese restrict communication between the Tibetans living in India and those still in Tibet. So she actually had no knowledge whether the gift was carrying on in the family. But it was very interesting, the family connection there. I've already sort of said this, but I wanted you to see it very clearly, that not everyone who practices meditation attains samadhi. So not everyone who practices meditation will get the 100% reliable psychic awareness. There's a genius for meditation, there's a genius for enlightenment, there's a genius for psychic awareness. We can all learn anything, but not everyone has that talent. Only a few have the genius. However, we do all benefit in many ways from practicing meditation. And now and then, we have the great pleasure of being in the presence of somebody with genius. Thank you all very much. Five minutes. Yeah. Okay, Serena would like to take a few questions. We've only got five minutes, but if there are any questions, now is your chance. Uh, all right, gentlemen here. Serena, in your uh, graphs, you had years of. of meditation along the bottom and you had some measure of psychic capacity yes. or ability. What, how did you measure psychic capacity? Okay, um, how did I measure psychic capacity? What I had to do was find a statistically scientific test that Tibetans who have had nothing to do with science whatsoever could actually relate to. So it was a bit of a tricky one which took us two to three years to develop. But essentially what I did was I had my laptop, very similar to this, just a slightly different um, version. And in it I had 100 photographs, initially all of Tibet, and then on the second series a mixture, photographs of Tibet and of India. So we had greater variety. And those 100 photographs got put into sets of four, so that in each set of four photographs, they would be as different as possible. So maybe one of a mountain view, one of a statue of Buddha, one of a yak, and one of a tanker. Yes? Or as different as possible. And the monk who was working with me knew that he was going to be seeing the four photographs at the end of the session, and that one of the photos would be his his picture. So he sat down to do the meditation and he made an intention to become aware of the picture that he would see at the end. He did the meditation. He then allowed himself to visualize his picture. He then drew it out. He then called me and the translator in and described the drawing. They weren't artists. The drawing needed to be explained. Then they got to see the four pictures and they rated each picture on a 1 to 100 scale. So some of them went 100%, that's the one, the, the high point people, that's the one, 100%. But they had to rate all four pictures, so you know, that's 100. This one, well I suppose if you look at it this way, I'll give it 50%, 10%, 3%. Then, having made their ratings, they got to see what their picture was. And that gave us a score. Now, the reason we did that is that it's very similar to one of the aspects of Mo divination, which is where they look into a lake to see a picture that will answer the question, like, let's say, where the next Dalai Lama is going to be born. Yes, so they look into the lake to see the picture. So we tried to take what they do and put it into a computer and make it into a scientific thing. So... It's very simple in one way and actually very difficult in another way, but we got interesting results from it. Yeah, okay, one very quick question followed by a very quick answer. One last question. <laughs> All right. Hold on one second. 
you said that those very high lamas were meditating for 40 years. How many hours a day were they meditating? And what would you recommend that we meditate for how long? His Holiness Dalai Lama gets up at four o'clock in the morning and does five hours of practice until nine o'clock when he has his breakfast and reads the world's newspapers. We can't all be Dalai Lamas. I recommend that you set yourself five minutes every morning, a bit like cleaning your teeth. If you can get it in there in a similar sort of a habit as brushing your hair and cleaning your teeth and only say to yourself, I've got to do five minutes, mm. then whatever the circumstances, whatever's going on in your life, it's going to be difficult for your mind to slip out of that commitment. If you say to yourself, I've got to do five hours, the mind's going to find every reason not yeah. to. Yeah? If you say to yourself five minutes... That tricky mind of yours is going to have a far harder job. Mm. Now, what you find is that once you've got it in there, so my practice is to get up, wash my face, get dressed, do my meditation before breakfast. Mm. And having got to sit down, mm. well, I could just stand up again if I'm really pressed, like I've got to come and give a talk. Actually, I did manage this morning. Um, but, you know, if I'm really pressed, I've got to catch a bus, I've got to, yes, then just sit there and then stand up again. That's okay, because I've sat. But once I've got that discipline going, mm. then I go to sit and I can manage. Five minutes, ten minutes, it increases. Uh -huh. It increases. Um, the Buddhists say four times a day. The yogis say minimum of twice a day, morning and evening. Uh -huh when you get up before you go to sleep. And they do recommend going to sleep in the meditation state. So I do a meditation, I go to bed and I sit in my bed mm. and do my final meditation so that then I'm going to sleep with that state of consciousness. Uh -huh. So that eventually I'll become a dream yogi as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Serena Roney-Dougal, many thank you.